and let's get the right part. Just uh, if you're interested in 
to learn more about what we do, we have several social media handles, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, and Twitter, as well as our contact information down below if you ever have any questions on the issue of reach out. So I'd like to give the floor to Raul Moas, who very kindly agreed to uh, give a little, a little bit of information on some of the plans uh, that are on the Indiana Valley. Thank you very much. So there's some of what I think are the This is This is the Pineland plant. This is Desmodium marilandicum. It is um, reasonably common in some of the eel properties. It has a spike now cut off of, of very attractive purple blue flowers. They're very small, but you know, in, in flowers, actually pretty attractive. It grows, like you see here, as, as a stem. It does not crawl or, or spread by rhizomes much at all. This is a baby uh, devil's potato, um, Echides umbilita. And it is uh, so-called because the, the, the tuber looks like a potato, exactly like a potato. It's, it's quite toxic, poisonous. Um, this is really tiny. This will grow into a twining uh, vine, you know, 20, 30 feet in the air eventually. It is the, one of the food plants for the uh, faithful beauty, the Composia fidlissima, one of the um, day-flying moths. If you've ever seen it, it's really spectacular. This is sort of a dubious native plant to Dade County. It is vouchered once in the county, uh, much more common in, in central and northern Florida and in much of the country. This is Mimosa stridulosa. Um, it grows as a matting uh, spreading plant. It is a sensitive plant. You touch it in the day and the leaves will you know, contract. It is the host plant for one of the smaller yellows. I can't remember which yellow. Are there any butterfly folks here that can tell me? Okay, one of the little yellows, uh, it's larva feed on this. Uh, these are two um, sweet acacia, acacia farnesiana, now vacelia farnesiana. They have like all acacias, all good acacias, they have thorns. So this is not a, a plant for like little kids that wander around and run into things. Um, very sweet smelling. It will not sprawl like acacia pectorum. Uh, it will grow straight tree and um, attractive except for the thorns. Um, this also is an unhappy plant. This is Traja saxicola. Um, it's got, what's its name? Noseburn, something noseburn. It, it, okay, it, it has little stinging hairs. It is one of the couple of stinging nettles that we have in South Florida, very, very pine land uh, type plant. It will grow spread by seed very easily and really just loves to spread. Um, nice if you have cats that you don't like, um, you know, stuff like that. It, it, is, it is a stinging nettle. It will sting for about three or four minutes. This is Havana skullcap, very pretty plant. It will clump, make little, you know, rhizomatous extensions and clump, very pretty with blue flowers, little blue flowers. Like, I think it's a mint type plant. Um, this is a small one. These are three Pine pinks, this is one of the ground orchids of South Florida, uh, found in pine lands and also in uh, prairies, in marl prairies. Um, clusters of flowers, I think once or twice a year, very attractive. These are relatively small and they will grow into a multi-tuber, multi-bulb uh, plant with time. 
reasonable care. They're not very, they're not very uh, difficult to care for. These are two small um, Asclepias incarnata. This is swamp milkweed, also rare in the county. It is vouchered here uh, in the Everglades, found a couple of places, but very uncommon, much more common up in Northern Florida and throughout much of the Eastern seaboard. It is, it, it will grow this tall, and if the monarchs don't get it, it will have spectacular pinkish flowers, very pretty flowers, uh, beautiful flowers, big. It will die back, it will die back, look like it's dead. And then a couple months later, it'll pop back up with more vigor. Um, these are clasping asters, another pineland um, wildflower. These are, are budding and will flower probably in a few weeks. This is uh, Symphia trichum now at Natus. Um, they will form, if, if left undisturbed, if animals don't get them, they will form like a little dome of these kind of brittle looking uh, stems with scaly leaves on them. And then in the autumn, they just are spectacular. I have maybe two centimeter wide flowers that are very pretty different tones of, of I don't know, they look bluish to me. Some people say they're more pink, but they're very pretty. This, this was a, a uh, this is a uh, Symphiotrichum concolor, and it had flowers, a flower spike that was knocked off just now. So I'm very unhappy, but it is, uh, it will come back. Also one of the native asters, very pretty. The stems are harder, but tend to droop a little bit and will, will sort of like sprawl in, but they'll, they also have large bluish flowers, very pretty. This is, Simmons aster, aster uh, Symphiotrichum simonzi. This aster is, is uncommon. It was actually found just recently by, uh, who was it? It was Patty. I think it was Patty. Ferris found it in, uh, in Penny, uh, Larry and Penny Thompson Park in some of the wetter areas there. And it actually is reported it's vouchered, but it was like sort of a, like a rediscovery, so to speak. Um, will grow by rhizomes. Unlike the other asters that will grow in a clump, these will actually spread, spread by rhizomes. So you'll see one, and then a few months later, there's three or four little, little children around it. Um, this is a, a pretty big Ruelia carolinensis. Um, this is the wild petunia. If y'all uh, have not seen it, it is a beautiful purple blue flower. It's one of the biggest of the purple blue flowers of, of South Florida, really beautiful flower. Um, lasts a day or so, but very nice plant. And this is a seven-year apple. Yes, yes. Uh, Cassasia clusifolia. They grow to be medium-sized trees, uh, very pretty trees, beautiful trees, nice kind of wrinkly bark. They're, they're fantastic specimen trees. They're nice as borders for, for streets. They're very attractive trees. Um, there's something about the fruit. People say the fruit smells bad or looks bad or something about it. I don't know exactly, but they're, but they're beautiful trees. And that's it, I think. Thank you so much for all. Thank you again. And, um, and one more thing I'd like to mention. So we have a few small pots at the end of the table. Um, those are for uh, anybody who would like to take a few uh, pots home uh, to get some seeds started for, uh, for Native Plant Day. We have a very large raffle that, uh, that usually happens at Native Plant Day. So if you'd like some, feel free to take a handful if you'd like to start some, uh, some new plants. All right, so let's get started with the, the main event. Adrian, would you like to uh, set up the audio? Um, our speaker today is uh, Adrian uh, Berger, who has a very particular uh, introduction. Um, Adrian is an extension agent of America, formerly with the University of Florida, but I have an extension in Miami Dade County. Adrian, you have a Well, thank you so much. It's been about three years since I've last spoken to you. And since I'm one of the few entomologists that actually goes out and interacts with, with people, that's usually what I'm asked to talk about. But this time we decided to change things up a little bit and do a topic that maybe you haven't heard too much about, which is, you know, you have 
questions about how your plants are doing in your landscape and um, not quite sure what's going on. So this is, you know, I'm trying to teach you a little bit tonight on um, how to diagnose uh, landscape uh, issues. And do I have um, yeah, an advance? I mean, I can also just post the slides uh, as, as you're ready. So. Or I can just hit the down arrow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, um, in your, and I'm going to try to um, really concentrate on native plants because, of course, it makes sense. You're enthusiasts of native, native plants of South Florida. But sometimes, you know, we come across something like this that just shows up randomly in the landscape and we're not quite sure what could be the problem. So um, you're going to have to be sort of like Sherlock Holmes uh, or CSI and try to figure out, well, what could it be? Um, maybe it's an insect, it could be a disease, could be a nutritional deficiency. Abiotic, does everybody know what abiotic means? It comes from something that's not living. So it could be environmental. So it could be weather related or something else. Um, so sometimes it's gonna be a process of elimination because um, plants don't necessarily tell you what's bothering them. They're just telling you they're bothered. <laughs> Something's not quite right. Um, is that in focus for you guys? It looks a little... Yeah, it's just, just something that this projector has done for months now. I'm not, not quite sure how to, uh, how to get it. Okay. Well, this is, this is a silly picture, but that's one of my colleagues uh, with the University of Florida. And even though I'm retired, I can't take my extension hat off. I just am so passionate about uh, teaching and interacting with the public. Um, and I'm just thrilled that uh, I was invited to speak with you tonight. Um, so sometimes you have to kind of figure out if, if, you know, what's the history? Was it because we had a hurricane uh, a few months ago? Well, we didn't, but let's pretend we did. Um, and then several months later, or maybe a year or two later, you're starting to see the impact on trees. Maybe the trees aren't growing as well as they had in the past. Um, could be a cold front that came in, a cold snap. And, you know, we haven't had any freezing temperatures in quite a few years. Doesn't mean we're not going to at some point. And we have to remember, oh, well, maybe the damage is going to actually show up a few months later, not right after the cold event. But as taxpayers, you're paying for a service called uh, extension. It's through the run through the University of Florida. There's an office in every single county, and this county actually has five offices. But the one in Homestead is the one that that uh, is horticulture and agriculture, um, and they are part of a network, a nationwide network of experts trying to diagnose different plant problems. They're not there just to diagnose problems. Uh, if you wanted advice on what to plant in your yard or how to overcome soil problems or drainage problems or, or what have you, um, they've got experts to help you. But um, I tell my master gardeners and Mary Rose was a master gardener when I started back in 1999. <laughs> so I don't know when she took the course, but before I, uh, I got to, to teach the class, and um, I always tell my master gardener volunteers when they're interacting with the homeowners, you've got to see the patient. You can't accurately describe a problem because what you think might be the problem really isn't the problem that we need to see. We need to see maybe other plant parts that will actually help us come to a diagnosis. Um, okay. So I took this image years and years and years ago on Biscayne Drive on my way to the extension office. And this person obviously was very passionate about palms, had a lot of very expensive palms. And the two uh, canary ants, the, the um, canary island date palms were dying at the same time. So I got my wheels going like, what could be going on? What could be the explanation? 
before you go into the disease. Okay. Um, is it a disease? It's hard to tell. Dead plants tell no tales. Could be insects that could be causing this problem. Could it be nutritional? Who knows? Lightning, that's a possibility, especially if it happened in the summer. Could be herbicides, again, or something else. Um, I actually did diagnose what the problem was. I knew exactly what the problem was. And I did try, it's one of the rare events I actually tried to reach out to the homeowner because technically um, as university of Florida personnel, we weren't supposed to be going into somebody's yard and say, hey, you know, I'm the local expert and I'll tell you exactly what's wrong with your plant. Um, but uh, it was already too late to save these palms and um, they're no longer there. All right. So one of the things I like to see, um, it was um, a palm weevil. And you don't know that you've got a palm weevil infestation because it goes into the meristem, the heart of the palm, and it eats it. I'm going to show you some examples. Um, and you don't know you've had a problem until the palm suddenly dies. And the dot, it takes about three or four weeks. If it was a disease, it would take longer. That's why I kind of knew what it was. All right. So a lot of times, if you're having a problem with a shrub or a tree, I'll actually ask to have images of the base of the plant. Why would I want that? It's, like, it's, it's the canopy that's having a problem. Why should I think about looking at the base of the plant? Right, right. It also gives me an indication if it was planted correctly. And I can't tell you how often I see incorrectly planted trees. Um, this is an indication. So when you're planting, you should have the, the base, the flare roots, you know, where the, the, the widest part of the trunk needs to be above ground. Most people don't know that. Most people think, oh, I don't want my, my tree to shift over when I plant it, so I'll plant it deep so the soil will keep it upright. Good way to guarantee to lose your tree over time. So I can see immediately something's going on. There's no flare going on here. I don't know what the cause is. I have a sus suspicion. The other thing too is if this was just bark um, coming off the flare root and it wasn't caused by a car, or a lawnmower or somebody acting nuts. Um, again, that's an indication of a root problem. And the reason why I like to concentrate on the roots is because that's a part of the plant we never see. And we kind of maybe forget how important, as you said, that's how the plant gets water up to the canopy. And also the canopy produces food through photosynthesis and takes it down to the roots. Um, the other thing too is sometimes you'll see nutritional deficiencies. And I know you know more, a lot more about plants than most other people do. What's the first reaction if you start seeing leaves that are starting to turn yellow? You fertilize it, right? because that's what all the ads and TV commercials and gardening magazines tell you what to do. Um, and I wanna see what's going on here because this is gonna tell me right away, if it, is it really a nutritional issue or is it a root issue? Um, and also poor and slow growth. I have a, a little mantra I teach my master gardeners Plant it high, it won't die. Plant it low, it won't grow. So when people say, oh yeah, I planted my plant a couple of years ago and it's just sitting there. It's not doing anything and I'm watering it and I'm fertilizing, I'm taking great care of it. I know immediately it was planted too deep. Okay, so this is a really huge issue, this girdling roots. Now, never mind. <laughs> That's kind of self-evident why you have girdling roots because it's the poor tree was surrounded by asphalt. But this is a nursery issue. 
This is, starts when that plant is first started in the nursery or in a plant pot. Uh, because a lot of times this is all underground and um, especially in nurseries, if the economy is going bad, they're gonna, those plants are gonna sit in the pots longer than they should be because it costs the, the uh, nurserymen money to step off that plant to the each, you know, to get into larger and larger containers. And what happens because this is all underground is you've got these wrapping roots that eventually will choke the base of that tree. And you'll never know that until that tree comes out of the ground, either because it's dead and you're having it removed or a hurricane pops it out of the ground for you. Um, this is another thing. So these are girdling roots. These are all roots that almost look like they should be that way, but they're not. Um, and you can actually do things um, to overcome some of these things. And you'll have to invite me to another lecture and I can go into all this <laughs> with you. Ah, teaser, huh? All right. Other things is, you know, when the top growth is just thinning out, not doing really well, also, you see a lot of water sprouts. That's an, also another indication that the root system is not doing well. Uh, leaves too small and yellowing. So again, it sounds like a nutritional deficiency and it's not, it's a root issue. So here's a, uh, a plant from that, I'm from Virginia. So we have ginkgos up North um, and you don't, you know, we don't hear. But see, you look at this tree and go, oh my gosh, it's got some bug or some disease is killing that poor tree. If you look at the base, what's missing? Can you see? A, a big, big piece of the bark has come off. So that's, the, and it's not by the road, so we can probably eliminate a truck or a car hitting the tree. Um, that's again, and also I don't see any flare roots down here. So that's all an indication that there's something going on underground. So you'll see leaves smaller than usual, they'll be more yellow. So those again are indications of a root problem. Okay. So one of the biggest things is buying uh, plants that already have surfing roots. I tell people when you go to a nursery and you're buying a plant, if the owner has a problem with you taking that plant out of the pot so you can see if it's got circling roots or not, then I wouldn't be buying that plant from that nursery. Even if you go to the big box stores, you should be taking the pot off to see if even if you're starting to get some of those wrapping roots because already you know you're buying something that's going to potentially have problems. Um, sometimes people will add a lot of mulch too close to the trunk of the tree, um, adding soil over the roots, and of course, damage from equipment. So I took this picture uh, a few days ago at the extension office, because I, I live in Homestead. These are two um, uh, gumbo limbos that were planted probably over 30 years ago. I'm assuming they were about the same size. They were planted at the same time. Do you notice any differences? Size, yep. Yeah. So one is smaller than the other. Um, and I'm sorry for the color. It's kind of coming out kind of weird, but um, look at the base of the trees. Yeah, so this one you're not seeing much in the way of flare roots. This one you're seeing great flare roots and actually a lot of surface roots. So this is an example, this is a close up of the smaller tree. And you can see there's a lot of girdling roots, roots that have been run over by lawn mowers. So there's been a lot of damage going on that's keeping that tree from really thriving. And this is the one, it's sister or brother next to it. And what do you see? You have lots of roots. You want roots to come out like spokes of a wheel. So this is a great example of exactly what you wanna see. Now, a lot of people say, well, I, you know, my yard, I don't want all those roots up above the soil. Um, what could you do to tell people that 
would do something to placate their wishes and not harm the tree, what would you suggest? You could mulch, right? Mulch. You can plant some plants that, that tolerate some shade and don't really need any care at all. Maybe bromeliads would be a good choice. Um, or just, you know, you just plant a tree like that in the part of the yard where you don't really uh, don't care. Now, if you had a lot, a lot of kids playing touch football or soccer or whatever, then yeah, you don't want them tripping over those roots. But then I tell parents, well, teach your child not to be running over the roots of your trees. Uh, this is an example. This was actually, I took this uh, image at Bell Glade at the research station. So the researchers at Bell Glade work on sugarcane. They know nothing about landscape plants. So they had to hire a company to come in to plant these trees for them. And me and my fellow horticulturists were going out there and we're just going, oh my gosh, what did they do? Because first of all, it looked like telephone poles coming out of the ground. So automatically we knew it was too, too deep. You can see, even if it, and this is, kind of the soil level. So, you know, it's a little bit of mulch, which that's okay. We dug down almost 12 inches before we got down to the roots. Now, needless to say, the following year when we had another meeting at Bell Glade, those trees were gone. They didn't survive. And they're not on rocky soil. So they're lucky they're on, on the peat muck that, uh, it's so beautiful. You see this all the time, volcano mulching, right? People hear all about these wonderful things to do with mulch, if you do it the right way. And um, the University of Florida has fact sheets on all sorts of different things. Um, the Miami-Dade County Extension Office has ones that we've specialized just for our county, but the university, the main website has tons of information too. So what happens is first of all, trunks are not meant to be moist all the time because one of the things about mulch is your whole, you know, locking in some, some moisture. So you've got it wrapped around a part of the plant that's not meant to be moist all the time. The other thing too is all the roots are going, oh man, it's so nice under here. I'm not gonna go out here. So you're actually encouraging circling roots and girdling roots. And you will never notice until you rake all that mulch away to see that's what you're creating. So things that rarely cause plant decline. Most diseases don't cause plant decline. Now there's a few exceptions, especially for palms. Insects rarely cause, cause plant decline. Nematodes, everybody hears about nematodes and they're worried about nematodes. Well, if you're growing tomatoes, maybe. And there's only one species of nematode you need to worry about. Um, and nutritional deficiencies rarely cause plant decline. I'm gonna show you some of the um, exceptions. Okay. So here's some more trees in landscapes. You see any root flare going on here? No. Do you see anything else that doesn't look, look quite right? And this is a huge problem in the landscape. I mean, huge. Weed whackers. How many of you remember when weed whackers were first um, invented? This is dating me, but I think there's a lot of boomers who remember the first TV commercials are saying, oh, this is really gentle. It won't hurt your plants. And they would have a guy have his bare leg and have somebody with a weed whacker, you know, using it. Well, the horsepower on those weed whackers back then was pretty low. Nowadays, they took the paint off my car. Yeah. So... Um, it caused tremendous amount of damage. And most landscape people have no clue, 
absolutely no clue how much damage they can cause. So how many of you have heard about xylem and phloem tissue in, inside plants? Okay. So the xylem is the wood. That's the, the internal structure that's carrying the water taken up from, from the roots up to the canopy of the plant. So that's the wood. There's a very, very, very thin layer of tissue called the phloem. And that's what takes the food produced by photosynthesis down to the roots to keep the roots alive. It's only a few cells thick and it's right underneath our so-called bark. And you know, most of our tropical trees have practically no bark to speak of. It's very, very thin. So it doesn't take much to start causing tremendous injury. And you can actually kill a tree. And I went to the extension office this afternoon to get some samples and I'm looking around. I was there last week and then something caught my eye and went, that's why that tree's dying. I looked at the base of it, completely girdled. You can't recover from that or the plant can't recover from that. So that's string trimmer damage. And there are all sorts of things you can do to prevent it. And it's all about prevention. Again, a great topic for another lecture. All right. So this is a Dahoon Holly at the extension office. And to show you the actual color of those leaves, That's because I was concerned that here, if you want to look at this. Most people would say, oh, it's light yellow. It looks like a nutritional deficiency. Let me start putting fertilizer on it. Well, let's take a closer look here. Here's the base of it. No flare. I know it's planted too deeply. And the person who actually is managing this part of the property of the extension office is intentionally planting plants incorrectly. Some of them correctly, some of them incorrectly. So he can take the landscape maintenance people out there and say, okay, I, did, I planted these plants five years ago. What differences do you see? So it was a really good idea of his. Um, but all around, it's all completely girdled from weed whacker damage. That's why it's not doing well. Um, this is a trunk of an avocado. That's actually daylight from the other side of that trunk you're seeing. That's often caused by improper pruning. It can also be from hurricane damage and nobody came back to uh, clean up um, the damaged limbs. And so over time, you get decay and you don't see the decay because it's internal until we get another hurricane and that tree just falls all apart. This is from Miami Beach Botanic Garden. I took this image years and years ago. They asked me to come out. They had an ancient sea grapes. You can imagine how old that sea grape was. They had two of them. And I'm looking at it and I see immediately what the problem is. Do you? Pat racked it multiple times, exactly. And that eventually led to internal decay. And unfortunately, they had to have those two trees removed. I would assume those were probably about 100 years old. You know, when, when Miami Beach was first developed, I bet you that's when they were planted. And it was sad to see that happen. So there, there is a proper way of pruning. If you need to prune, most trees actually don't need to be pruned, but the cuts have to be done correctly. So if you ever do need to have a professional come out and prune, make sure that they have um, their certified arborists from the International Society of Arboriculture. It's ISA, and they have to have a card with them to prove that they've um, passed the exams and they're certified arborists. A tree trimmer, they're great for removing trees that you just want to get off your property. I would not hire a tree trimmer to do any 
pruning of my plants on my property. Okay, so let's switch over to uh, nutritional deficiencies. Depending on the time of year, but mostly on which part of the plant that deficiency first shows up helps you determine which uh, or narrow down uh, which deficiency it can be. So this is a very common deficiency. And this I took from a sable. Anybody want to guess what this is? Super, super, super common. Well, I'll show you in a minute. So for this deficiency, because it could look like a disease, right? Maybe a rust or something. If you hold the leaf up to light, you can actually see light coming through it. If it was a disease, you wouldn't be able to see that. And that is potassium deficiency. Do you need to treat for it? Usually not, but you also have to make sure you don't actually have a root problem that could be causing the issue. Um, this is potassium deficiency in the royal palm. It's getting kind of frizzled looking. This is on sable. Um, again, I'm sorry for the, the color, but it looked better on my computer screen and on my camera phone. Um, but you can see a lot of yellowing, especially at the tips of, um, of the leaflets. More potassium deficiency. Um, so you see that always first on the oldest leaves. And that's because the plant is able to take the potassium from the old leaves and put it up into the bud, the meristem of the palm. That's why it's recommended not to remove old fronds. If there's any bit of green still left on that frond, leave it on the palm because the palm is translocating that potassium from the old parts to the new parts. Here's another example. So you can see the oldest frond has the most pronounced symptoms. And when it gets really bad, the tips will start turning brown as well. Yes. Ah, I'm glad you asked me that because I was actually remembering uh, when I was out in the landscape this afternoon about that question. Um, there was a palm specialist at Fort Lauderdale Research Station and she actually studied that three days for a palm frond to naturally go from green to dead three days. That's what's normal for a palm. We never see that, right? We see, you know, this is going on for months and months that the old fronds are just starting to slowly senesce or get old. So what we're seeing is actually not quite normal. Is it something to worry about? The answer is it kind of depends. So here, these are royal palms. What do you notice? It's starting to get really thin here. All the old fronds are gone. We don't know if they've been removed, pruned off, or they've just fallen off. But you can see those palms are in severe uh, distress. Um, and in this case, when it gets this bad, there's nothing, you can't save those palms. This is an example on a broadleaf plant. And what you'll see is the margins or the edges of the leaves are gonna to start to turn brown. Now, I don't know, I didn't bring any samples on a broadleaf. It could also be salt burn. So that's why I'm saying when you're diagnosing, you have to use process of elimination. So if you're really close to the beach, and you've got a plant that's not quite adapted to salty conditions, that could also be the problem as well. Usually though, it's potassium deficiency. 
that shows up first on the oldest leaves that will lead you towards manganese deficiency. So the chlorosis, the yellowing where the uh, veins are still green, but it's kind of yellow in between the veins. So the old, that shows up on the oldest leaves first, that's manganese. That shows up on the newest leaves, it's iron deficiency. And why do we have iron deficiency down here? I mean, we don't see it on a lot of plants. There's just a few that really have a problem with iron deficiency. Is that a characteristic of the rocks in soil? It's the pH of our soils, exactly. So um, our soils are made out of calcium carbonate, which is limestone, which is very alkaline. We can't change it. So we naturally have to grow plants that are adapted to it. This is Exora, which is an acid loving plant. Um, and that's why you see Exora is not doing very well in South Florida, because it's an issue of a plant adapted to a different, totally different type of soil condition, which is a high, uh, low pH soil. So let's talk a little bit about diseases. All right. So if you have a palm that's very slowly die, dying, uh, it indicates a disease. And this is one disease that uh, hits older palms. And on this case, it's a sable. You start seeing this, these growths. Those are conchs, called conchs. That's gan Ganoderma butt rot. There are other diseases that are wiping out um, the te Texas Phoenix palm decline is also hitting um, Sable's really, really hard up you know, a little bit further north of here. So if you have orange Geiger, I mean, have you ever seen the orange Geiger beetle? Here's the adult, very beautiful beetle, but it's the larvae, the immature stages that cause this ratty, um, um, ratty appearance to, to the trees. Some years you'll notice it's a lot worse than other years. Doesn't hurt the plants at all. So if you had an orange Geiger tree and you didn't want your guests or Martha Stewart, who's coming down to visit you, to think you're a terrible gardener, put your orange Geiger tree in the backyard where the neighbors don't see it, where you can still enjoy its beauty. Okay, this is Dr. Robin Giblin Davis. I had done uh, research with him for several years on the um, Palmetto weevil, this is the largest North American weevil that we have. The problem is it's all inside. So the grubs eat that heart of palm. And when they finish doing their work, that's when you get the pop neck. And those are sables that were recently transplanted. So they're very vulnerable because they're under stress. Just like with humans, when we're under stress, we're more vulnerable to disease or uh, problems. In this case, um, the plant produces chemicals that cue in the female weevil to come and lay her eggs. So, hey, I'm not doing so hot here. Why don't you come over and finish me off? Kind of a morbid way of looking at it. Low bait lack scale. Remember when we used to have wax, wax myrtles all over down here and you don't see them anymore? Most of them, they succumb to this uh, scale. I brought some samples with me because it's still active. Uh, we have it on one of the stoppers at the extension office and the plants had it for ever since the, the scale first showed up. Um, and it's doing fine. It just doesn't look great, but it's, it does fine. This is one of the few scales that you actually will find on the really thin stems. I think most of you are used to seeing scales on the leaves. So this is one that you have to actually look at the stem. And I've got examples. And after my lecture, you're more than welcome to, to come up. I've got some magnifying lenses. So knock yourselves out. Okay. This is satin leaf. 
So in this case, uh, most insects prefer to be on the underside of leaves. Why would they want to be there? Their prey, right? There's things out there who want to eat them. They're protect, they're hiding from the predators. That's the number one reason. So that's really good thinking, but it's actually because you're not gonna, the predators aren't going to find them as easily if they're, if they're underneath the leaf. When I start seeing scales on the top side of the leaf, I know if I flip that leaf over, it's got a really bad infestation. And I brought an example um, where the whole underside of the leaves are just white with scales. Okay, so let's talk about environmental problems. It's summertime. What do we have plenty of? Thunderstorms. And the very next day, you've got a dead palm on your hands. And that's really indicative of a, of a lightning strike is to get that one flag leaf still standing up and the others just kind of collapse. Uh, it usually kills the palm. Sometimes, when it hits um, another type of plant, you'll actually see the scorch mark where the lightning bolt came down the trunk of the tree. I don't see that very often. That was actually an uh, image taken, I think, in central Florida. Is that a pine? Yes, it is. So it's, it's usually quick when it's, a, when it's been a direct hit. Sometimes it's tricky to diagnose one that's been indirectly hit because it could take weeks for it to manifest that it had been hit by lightning. Usually you're going to have clues where, where you know, that bolt actually hit something nearby. So I've seen all sorts of crazy things, but I left them out of this presentation because I don't have enough time to go into all the crazy things that I've seen. I saw one that was hit and it was smoking still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I've seen it actually hit, you know, a piece of metal and it splatters out and kills everything around it. Um, so this is a clusia hedge. And do you see something going on here? Sunburn, exactly. And how do you know it's sunburn versus a disease? Because the underside of the leaf is fine. If it was a disease, the underside of the leaf would actually show some damage as well. Now, um, I went back to this hedge. I was going to try to get some samples today, but the homeowner was home and I wasn't going to say, well, I'm giving a talk tonight. Would you mind if I take some of your damaged leaves? And I thought, no. Um, so I brought something else instead. Um, so sometimes just flipping the leaf over. So if it's damage that shows up on the top of the surface of the leaf, it's almost always environmental. So you can see this is a cardboard cycad and you can actually see where there was a leaf over it. So that was, this part was under shade. And if somebody pruned it or that leaf moved, then that tissue gets sunburned. So just flip it over, and if it looks green underneath, then you know it's a physical damage. But no, but I've had people who are professional um, landscapers who've had it misdiagnosed as thrips, which it's not. So if they thought if it's an insect and they start treating for the insect, it's not gonna have any impact because it was sunburn. So this is something that trips people up a lot because we don't think about plants getting sunburned. Um, how about this? Have you ever seen this on trees where you see lines of these little holes? What's, what's that caused by? That's right. And I had to take, I figured you knew what it was. I, for master gardeners, I put in there, it's a bird. 
Um, and no, it doesn't hurt the tree at all. And, and um, this is the black olive at, at the extension office, which used to be considered a native. It's probably the largest black olive in Florida now. It's a champion tree. Um, so it's really a beautiful tree, but yeah, if there were no leaves on that tree, I could tell it was black olive because that seems to be the species preferred. I've seen it on oak, I've seen it on um, coconuts. So I bet, boy, they're in the surprise. They didn't get any sap out of those. Okay, so sooty mold is that black fungus. And these examples I have up here are really good, you know, show you um, quite clearly that you have a sap feeding insect problem. And that's what you need to look for. Whether you treat for it or not um, kind of depends, but usually um, I recommend not doing anything. Now, if this stopper was in, in my front yard and it looked pretty, gnarly maybe i would want to do something to it but um most plants can you know plants and insects have co-evolved for millions of years so if insects were that damaging to plants plants would have been wiped out millions of years ago right so there's kind of like a bit of co-evolution going on how about this lichens I even have lichens on leaves. So I'll pass that around. So that's on the top surface. So this, the lichen on the leaves usually shows up on leaves that stay on plants for more than a year and are in shade. Doesn't do anything. Um, it's just, you know, lichens just need to grow on something and that's what um, they're growing on. But often, when people notice all the lichens on the trunks of the trees, it's when um, maybe the, the leaves are naturally falling off and all of a sudden you start noticing the lichen and people, oh my God, the terrible disease, it's calling, causing my plant to lose all its leaves. No, it's been there all along. And it's fun, this is a royal palm and I had me and my master gardeners actually counted how many different species of lichen were growing on the royal palm. And I think we stopped around six or seven different species. So they're kind of cool looking organisms. So one of the big take home meth, uh, uh, things, especially you know, whether it's native or non-native is putting the plant in the right spot. So part of the reason why that Dehoon Holly was doing so poorly at the extension office, the extension office, the aquifer is only about three feet below soil surface. Uh, there's no irrigation system going on at all at the extension office. But you know that Dehoon Holly is a plant that's evolved in the margins of forests, right? Where maybe they're getting more water like in the Everglades. So sometimes plants can do fine away from their natural conditions, their natural habitat, and can cope in our landscapes. And sometimes they're kind of iffy and sometimes they just utterly fail. Um, the other big thing is planting it correctly. Use mulch. I think all of you have, know about the benefits of mulch. And also there's a research project that was done to see exactly how much water and how often you need to uh, water plants to get them established. And then at, once they're established, they should be left on their own. But there is um, some guidelines from the university. Again, if you run into a problem that you can't quite figure out or you would like to have an expert um, look at it and cooperate what you think could be the problem. Call the extension office. This is a phone number. It's free. Well, you're, it's not for, well, the services are free. You're paying for it through your tax dollars. And we figured out you're spending less than a dollar a year of your tax money to pay for this. So, you know, that's a pretty good bargain. Um, you can also Google Mommy Date Extension, you'll to, right to the website. The website is terrible. We hated it. 
I threw temper tantrums when the university switched over to this new system. Um, but um, a lot of the fact sheets I've written over the years are on that website from, for Miami-Dade County. So it's written specifically for our conditions here in South Florida. Um, so in the search window, when you get onto the homepage for the, um, the county uh, website, um, you can put in a search term like tree planting or planting or native plants or whatever you're looking for, butterfly plants. You'll get to fact sheets or resources that we have on our website. And this is a program that was started from Sarasota County years and years ago. It used to be called Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Program. You might have heard about that. It's now called the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. It's really trying to teach homeowners how to um, care for their landscapes in an appropriate way. So, because there's so many, there's so much misinformation and uh, bad information and poor guidance out there. We're trying to, to really help people um, overcome that challenge. So that's the end of my presentation. And I know one of the, Jeannie had mentioned about, people were asking about aphids. Can somebody turn the lights on? Oh. Okay, so this is firebush. I collected this this afternoon. And I was looking for, last week, it, the firebush at the office had no aphids on it. And I'm going, come on, it's the right time of the year. I know you guys have aphids. So start, as soon as I start seeing the new growth kind of crinkled, uh, oh good, my buddies, the aphids are here. Aphids don't kill plants, okay? Unless they're on your prize winning orchid flower, I would say leave it alone because I will guarantee you in a couple of weeks, the natural enemies of the aphids will have found them and will have cleaned up those plants. And I'm not kidding you, I would take master gardeners um, when I was teaching them entomology, I would go out the day before to check the landscape, like which plants I, am I gonna show my, my master gardeners? And the day of the lecture, 24 hours later, I would like, I, I'm not crazy. I know this plant had this, you know, these aphids on it. And then usually a master gardener would say, oh, look, there's a ladybug. I went, yep, see? So it happens really fast. It's really kind of cool. So I have uh, samples up here. I've got uh, Lysoloma that has the lobate lax scale on the, on the stems. This is um, stopper coffee and um, different examples. So if you like, you're welcome to use uh, so magnifying lenses and, and uh, look at the plants. So, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Adrian? Uh, that includes on, uh, on YouTube. If you guys can type oh, questions, okay. I can uh, relay them. That's great. I've never live streamed before, so that's cool. Yes. It's a mildew, but it's not sooty mold. But I have seen it happen on silver buttonwood that's in full sun. So I'm not sure, maybe it's showing up more in the summer because of the rainfall. Um, I mean, you can't do anything about it. I think what it is is because silver buttonwood has all those little um, hairs on them. It, it just forms the right habitat for that mold to to grow on. And yeah, and sometimes it doesn't make the plant look particularly attractive, but I don't know if anybody else has really looked at it, looked into it that much. It's something that I, I seem to see more when the plants are, I mean, that's a very cool like plant. Mm -hmm. And if it's, uh, I, I planted one <laughs> on the north side 
that in my house for me. Um, and I've got a chronic problem with the, the lowest rate of getting Right. The ones that are out in the sun, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be a problem. Okay. I, I I wouldn't worry about it, but yes, it's not attractive. Um, I was just wondering if it was if it's something related to the stress on the plant because it's not that part of the plant's not getting the light that it really wants, or maybe it's because it's not getting enough light. There's more humid environments there. It it could be right, and you know also UV radiation kills spores of bacteria and. Fungus. So, in the case of mold, it would be a fungal growth. Um, I don't know if maybe somebody at FIU, you know, if a student is looking into it. I don't know. I haven't heard any research projects on it. It'd be interesting to find out. But yes. You know, last time I ever was in my yard, it was the base of one of my oak trees. I said, "You got to check that fungus out." And I killed oak. So are there fungi that, that kill oak trees? And if I wanted to go further, I just can I take a picture of it and send it to the extension service? Yeah. So so it's a symptom of another problem. So the fungus itself is not directly killing the tree. It's a symptom that the tree is under tremendous stress. Something's really wrong. And that what you're seeing, so what was it? Was it growth on the bark itself or was it on the ground? No, it was on the bark. On the bark, okay. Um, it's, it's, they're called saprophytes, so they're not pathogens. So the Ganoderma butt rut I showed you only attacks palms. There is a similar disease that goes to hardwood trees, but it's not a pathogen, it's not causing disease, it's just breaking down a tree that's already dying. And so this is again, where a lot of people don't get the information. The information's out there um, and might give wrong information. I would not have the tree removed unless um, you had a test to see if you had a lot of internal decay already. Oh, that tree's been there for 70 years. Yeah, so there's you don't do anything. Yeah, you just leave them. You don't, yeah, you leave them alone. Yeah, yeah, you just. Should I take a picture of the Um, take take pictures. Take take pictures would be the best thing, and and make sure they're really in focus and and close enough or high enough resolution that they can blow them up on the computer screen. But um, I, with 99.9% .9 certainty, I will tell you it's a saprophyte. It's something that's breaking down the tissue because there's some other cause. So I would not worry about it. Okay. And removing them won't have any effect because the, the actual organism is inside the tissue of the, of the trunk. Yes. You had pictures of conks on uh, palm trees. For some reason, somebody told me that if there's a conch on a palm tree, the whole area is dead, never to plant another palm there again. Absolutely. Yeah, Dr. Monica Elliott is the researcher who's at the University of Florida Fort Lauderdale Research Station, spent a career studying that disease. Um, and that's true because the, um, the spores that come out of those conchs, you know, you've got millions of spores and they're landing, and she's, I think she said within 30 feet. Yeah, you can plant broadleaf plants, that's not a problem. But for palms, no, and there's no cure. They still can't, they can't grow it in culture, so that's why in the lab they can't actually grow it to test different antibiotics to see if they can help it, so. So once you see it comes on a palm, it's gone. It's gone, so. If you saw a conch starting to form, you remember the first image, it just looked like a, a piece of chewing gum, like scrape that off because it hasn't produced it. Once it comes that to like that shelf-like um, uh, anatomy, that's when the spores start dispersing. So you can go ahead and remove them, but once those spores start coming out, it's, it's already too late. Um, whether you choose to remove the palm right away to protect 
other poems nearby or if you just if you don't have any other poems in your in your landscape just live with it until the the poem succumbs because it takes months to maybe even a year for it to, to die so so i have a question from uh, from youtube and then i have my, my own question as well uh, so leslie is asking she has a calamondan tree that she thinks has cit uh, citrus minor and that the fruits are dropping with a round spot on the bottom, kind of rotten uh, and discolored. And she's wondering if just with that description, if, uh, if you think something specific might be going on and any, any kind of treat that might be impacted. Okay, so the question is on a Camondon fruit, they're dropping off prematurely and the bottom of it is rotted. That's a disease. So it's not related to any mites or, or insects or anything. Um, there's a whole website just devoted to citrus and if you just google uf citrus or uf calamondin or uf citrus diseases you'll get to the website that will help you kind of narrow down what it is uh, for the citrus industry it's really important not to let you you know not to lose your crop from diseases for as a homeowner um I'm not sure it's really that much of an issue, but I would not be growing citrus in South Florida. Yeah. So, and yeah, there's just so many problems with citrus down here. Just, you know, greening is the one that's wiping out the whole citrus industry. Uh, but there's a lot of other diseases um, that citrus is dealing with. And I know we live in Florida the land of citrus and I know a lot of us want to grow citrus but um, that's one plant you could give me the most beautiful citrus tree in the world I will not plant it in my yard so anyhow yes and then my follow-up question uh, but I'm curious who weed whacked your car you mentioned that it's yes well I <laughs> a gentleman who comes by once a month and mows my I have a multi-species landscape so um i don't care what's growing in my yard uh it at some point when i finish re-landscaping there, there will be no grass-like species growing um yeah so i told him specifically don't use the weed whacker around my plants i said you can edge along the sidewalk you can edge along the driveway well guess what my car bumper and the edge of my driveway were very close together. And after he left, I looked and it, the weed whacker actually uh, knocked the paint off the bumper. Now, I'm not terribly worried about it because it's an old Civic, but um, uh, anyhow, I just, I said, you know, please don't do this again because, you know, this is not a good thing. So that's the story. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, basically, palms that have a large meristem, think of Bismarckia, think of uh, sables. Um, it doesn't really go after um, royal palms. Uh, date palms it loves because date palms are under stress naturally because they come from the Mediterranean, which has the opposite climate we have. It's adapted to hot, dry summers, which we don't have. So they're always under stress. So, uh, yes, yeah, stress plants have a way of emitting chemical cues that these insects have honed in on um, and, and they come in. So I actually have a mechanics that's Stethoscope. How many of you have ever worked on a car engine? Okay, so you know what a mechanic stethoscope is. Yeah, to hear the valves if they're closing or not, right? Boy, am I dating myself? So it's a stethoscope that has a very long tube on it. Um, when I was doing research, I actually used it to detect if there were palm weevils inside the palms. Because if you stand and it's a heavy infestation, even though the palm looks fine, you can actually hear the uh, immature larvae eating inside it. So you can stand next to the palm, you can actually hear it. 
So with the mechanic stethoscope, I really, you know, I can really hear it really, really well. So yeah, um, there are things you can do ahead of time, but it's not generally a big problem in most people's landscapes. It's when you transplant. So if you're getting sables transplanted to your yard, call up the extension office. They can give you some clues what needs to be done before they're transplanted. So. Uh, not very well. That's why I use the, the mechanic stethoscope because I can actually, you know, the sound transmits through the stem or the trunk. Yeah. Yeah, and it, you can hear them. It sounds like clicking. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Yes. So the disease that's that's attacking. Oh, the white fly. Yeah, which is an insect. Uh, Gumbo limbo's are one of those native plants that kind of can struggle, especially in street trees, highway plantings, um, on the beaches. I see that they're under a lot of stress. And a lot of people over the years have been complaining about gumbo limbo's dying. And again, insects are a symptom of something else. That's what we see. It's cause and effect, right? You see something that's on the plant that's not supposed to be there. It must be causing the problem. It's usually a symptom of something else going on, that that plant isn't meant to be in that spot to begin with. Yeah, so that was the other thing too, is when we deal with homeowners and they start rattling off all the different problems in their landscape, I know the problem really is horticultural. How are they caring for those plants? And that's usually, that's the easiest to fix and that's the easiest to spot because there's so many mis, um, uh, misleading information out there um, where people just don't quite understand what to believe and just do what they feel is right. Even though I have a neighbor across the street who waters their, um, their green lawn every single day right now because it's not raining every day. Well, it rains in the morning before they get up and they put the little sprinkler. It's just a little tiny sprinkler. And I'm going, I live across the street. I've got a green lawn as well. And it's never seen water except for what's provided naturally, just as green. But, you know, people end up thinking these things and not really thinking, do I need to be doing certain things? Yes. Okay. Right. So it was a planting problem. It was a planting problem. And that's the thing is plants want to live. So they can be under a lot of stress and you don't know it until we get a hurricane. And remember, it was barely a category one up here. I lost every tree on my property. Now my planting problem is I don't dig a hole at all. I just set the plant on top of the ground because I'm in homestead. I have to have pickaxe to plant a little petunia. I'm not going to be doing that. Um, but you know, that, that was a very weird uh, hurricane because it lasted three days and, and the wind kind of just kept buffeting instead of that normal, you know, sustained howl that we normally get. So it caused a lot more damage than you would think. Right. So um, yeah, you don't know until it's, the damage is done. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. So. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Go out there in the middle of the night with your flashlight and your clippers and oops, oops. Yeah, I know. And it, and it's, it's tough because a lot of people are just going to say, oh, I don't, I, uh, uh, you're just a worried homeowner. There's nothing wrong or it's not my job or it's not my property. Um, I, you know, I don't know if you, you know, how to really approach that situation. So it's not part of the parks department? Pardon? It's not part of the parks department or is it private, like a, a community? Private. Okay. The HOA. And that's going to the board and just explain to them why it's an issue. And I think if you can clearly explain what's going to happen in the future, they'll un better understand. And maybe even come in with some pictures of showing, see, this is what happens over time. If you, you know, let's nip it in the bud now, take care of it now, um, unless you don't value these trees and you're going to lose them. So, and, um, you know, you, you, the extension office doesn't want to get involved, but master gardeners are great advocates. So you might want to call the office and find a master gardener who lives in your area who's willing to go with you to the board and explain what what is you know the, the problem that, that's being created. So I've had a lot of master gardeners actually go onto the board because they were so frustrated with how things were running. Uh, on their HOA, so yes. And I think this might be the last uh, question we have. Kind of time. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and if you want to have a really beautiful gumbo limbo, plant a seed. Because, you know, have you ever seen the difference between a seed grown gimbal limbo and one that's just a stick you put in the ground? Well, the problem with growing plants from cuttings is that you never get a good strong root system. It might be enough to support that plant, but at some point it's more likely to fail, not always. Um, and a lot of trees only produce those roots at the cut. The roots don't start up further up on the plant. That's true for most plants. Mm -hmm. So it's never going to um, sprout roots further up. The other thing too is with a seed grown gimbal limbo, you get this beautiful canopy on it. Mm -hmm. Instead of, and, and I love the architecture of, of the um, asexually propagated gumbos, you know, taking a stick and putting it in the ground because you get those twisty, gnarly kind of looking uh, branches. But um, yeah, it's hard to see a seed grown gumbo limbo, but when you see one, it, it, they're beauties. They're really, they'll have a, just a beautiful, even canopy to them and, and uh, nice shape. And they're gonna have a much better root system. So I guess I, I need to, call it a day thank and so i want to thank you so much thank you out there in uh in the ether world in the youtube world out there
right, guys, so we're going to uh, be setting raffle tickets for the next uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes and, uh, and go through that. So get your tickets if you want them.